The symbols describing him speak of his nature. Leopards are known for their ability to kill swiftly. The bear's feet speak of brute strength. And the lion's mouth is indicative of the beast's verbal authority. His roar commands attention. But for all his ruthlessness, power, and charisma, the beast is nothing without the dragon, Satan, his real source of strength. That's why Paul calls him the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Sounds like our old buddy Nimrod. The Greek word for perdition is apoleia, which means destruction, perishing, ruin, or waste. In other words, the apostle begs to differ with the Antichrist's self-assessment of his own wonderfulness. God will, too, when the time is right. Yahweh will consume him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they may be condemned, who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Second Thessalonians 2, 8 through 12. A great many will eventually believe that this politician is God, or at least a God, because he will apparently be able to perform all kinds of miracles, including rising from the dead. After all, what would a false Christ be without signs and wonders? Of course, it's all Satan's sleight of hand, lies and trickery, but those who have rejected the real Messiah will swallow it whole. This is not the first time God's role in man's condemnation has been addressed in Scripture, since some folks look at these passages and grumble, How unfair of him! We need to clear the air. As far back as the Exodus, we see the same sort of thing. There it is said that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In the first chapter of Romans, he is said to have given sinners up to uncleanness, to vile passions, and to a debased mind. Here he is seen sending them strong delusion. What gives? I thought God loved sinners. He does, so much that he set aside his glory, became a man, and sacrificed himself to pay the penalty for their crimes. But when people purposely turn their hearts from God's mercy, there is a limit to how much time he will give them to repent. Remember Noah? Remember Sodom? God never closes the door on people who are looking for him, but he sometimes locks doors that people have already slammed shut. There is a difference. Without getting prematurely wrapped up in the things the Antichrist will do during the tribulation, we have explored his appearing, his political situation, and his character. We know that he comes from somewhere within the old Roman and Greek empires, emerging as a world figure in the days following the rapture. He overthrows three nations on his way towards dominance of an influential ten-nation league. We know that he's an oily-tongued politician whose solution to the arab israel Israeli conflict makes him the most respected diplomat on earth, and we know that he, empowered by the Satan himself, has ambitions, concealed at first, to become a god on earth, worshipped as the promised one, the Messiah. <laughs> There is more to the geopolitical nature of earth in the days following the rapture of the church than the rise to power of one man, of course. 
One of the most frequently asked questions concerning prophecy is, where does America fit into the last days? It's a good question, considering how close we seem to be to the end, considering the current status of the United States as the last of the world's superpowers. Is it possible that Yahweh didn't know about us when he delivered his prophecies? In a word, no. But there aren't any obvious scripture passages referring to a great nation beyond the Western Sea. Why is that? Don't we count? If the genealogy of the seven sons of Seir the Horite could be enumerated in such detail and holy writ, why aren't Washington, Lincoln, and Chester A. Arthur given equal billing? The answer, obviously, is that the Bible is not a book about important events, history, prophecy, religion, good people, or bad people per se. It is, rather, a record of how Yahweh is saving his creation, the unfold of his plan of redemption through his son, Yahshua. That's why its narrative is restricted to stories and information that help us explain who he is, what he accomplished, what is expected of us as a result, and what he has planned for our future. There are huge hunks of otherwise noteworthy human history that have absolutely nothing to do with any of that. Thus, the very nature of Scripture dictates very good odds that when future events are prophesied, they'll have something to do with the nation of Israel, the church, or Christ himself. For these are Yahweh's chosen tools for achieving and communicating our redemption. In fact, people who have no contact with or impact upon the Jews, past or future, have little chance of being mentioned in the Bible, no matter how influential or infamous they are otherwise. That being said, both Israel and Christians have played significant roles in the unfolding of U.S. history such as it is. So it's not surprising that we tend to see ourselves in a generalized way in passages like the Great Commission. We are thankful to comprise one of the uttermost parts of the earth. Or we picture ourselves in obscure passages like the psalm we explored earlier predicting the Holocaust. This will be written for the generation to come. Literally, the last generation. That a people yet to be created may radiate Yahweh's light. Psalm 102.18 the United States was instrumental in creating a homeland for the Jews after World War II, and we have been their staunchest ally, sometimes their only ally, for over a half century since then, even though we have often pressured them to do things contrary to their own national interests. We have supported them with our money, our munitions, and our prayers. Beyond that, the world's largest concentration of Bible-believing Christians live in America, though we are a minority. Our founding fathers had the foresight to build religious freedom into our national structure, a concept that allowed Christianity to flourish as it had nowhere on earth, even though it also allowed scores of false religions to flourish right alongside us. It's the price we pay for the freedom to worship however and whomever we want. Although there is no prophetic passage exclusively addressed to America, there is one, and only one, that is so striking in its descriptions that some expositors, like me, can't help but see the United States in every line. Isaiah 18's near-term application was to sub-Egyptian Africa, Cush or Ethiopia, and their relationship to Assyria. But as we have seen, Yahweh often reveals prophecies with both near and far fulfillments in mind. It's entirely possible that although fulfilled in history, this one still has some life left in it. In fact, it seems obvious to me that Cush was only a whispered hint of the prophecy's primary objective. Isaiah wrote at a time when Assyria was emerging as the dominant world power. Egypt was at the time under the sway of its southern kingdom, Ethiopia, centered in today's southern Egypt and northern Sudan, stretching up the Nile from Aswan to Khartoum. Modern Ethiopia was then known as Abyssinia. They watched with trepidation as Assyria gobbled up one country after another and were relieved beyond words when Sennacherib's army was pruned by Yahweh at the gates of Jerusalem in 701 B.C. Now you could see Isaiah 37 for that. 
But Israel was warned not to enter into alliances with the anti-Assyrian government of Egypt, for they would be conquered by Assyria. This happened in 671 B.C. by Ezra Haddon. Hence the woe in verse 1. So the prophecy has seen an historical fulfillment already. But what about a secondary fulfillment? Is there one? I think there is. Let's take this thing apart and look at it. Woe to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which sends ambassadors by sea, even in vessels of reed on the water, saying, Go, swift messengers. Isaiah 18.1 this nation is identified as someone who sends ambassadors or messengers. The Hebrew word is malak, a word often used for angels. It is a land of whirring wings, as it says in the King James. The single Hebrew word tzatzal, rendered shadowed with buzzing here, is the same that is used for locusts. These days it's hard to hear of whirring wings without thinking of helicopters, the quintessential American military machine. Some commentators have taken the questionable translation of shadowed and seen America's national symbol, the spread-winged eagle. I don't buy it. There is some confusion as to whether this nation is the sender of the following message, as it's rendered here in the New King James, or the recipient. The word saying isn't actually there in the Hebrew, although supplying it is not necessarily incorrect. But since it makes more sense in the context of a secondary fulfillment, I'd like to suggest that this verse should read... Woe to the land of whirring wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which sends ambassadors by sea, even in vessels of reeds on the water. Go, swift messengers. In other words, the land with whirring wings is the same land as that described in the subsequent verses. The one against whom woe is pronounced is the same as that to whom the messengers, or is that angels, are sent. There is another reason I think they may be the same. If you'll recall, in the previous chapter I pointed out that Zephaniah 3.10 From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. Clearly fits America like a glove, although it was true in a limited sense of Egypt's southern kingdom, Ethiopia, as well. It seems that the phrase, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, has a double meaning, a near and far perspective. These are the only two occurrences of this geographical description in Scripture, however, so it's hard to be dogmatic. At any rate, woe is pronounced, so it's clear God is unhappy happy with them. It could be translated, alas. It's as if Yahweh is in agony over their fate. Go, swift messengers, to a nation tall and smooth of skin, to a people terrible from their beginning onward, a nation powerful and treading down, whose land the rivers divide. If you look at several English translations here, you'll notice a remarkable lack of unanimity. What the New King James Version and the NIV renders as tall and smooth of skin, the King James translates as scattered and peeled. What gives? Mashak means to draw out, hence either tall or extended, stretched out or scattered. And morat, interestingly, means obstinate in the sense of being independent. Somehow they also get peeled out of it. I would render the phrase, A nation spread out and independent. Either way, it sounds like America to me. So does the rest of the description. America began its history by defeating the greatest military force on earth. Britain thought we were terrible, even if no one else did. We are definitely powerful, and what about treading down? The King James renders it meted out, that is, measured, which is primarily what kavkav means. No nation has ever been so thoroughly meted out.